I have something that's really, really exciting um, that many of you have been waiting to hear. Now, way back in 2019, three weeks ago, um, I shared with you guys that our giving goal for this year was $195,000, that that's what we were hoping that our congregation were able to give in order to meet our expenses and cover the ways that we had um, committed ourselves to give generously to those in our congregation, to those in our community, and even those globally. And so we needed to sort of hit that goal. And so with 15 days to the end of the year, we had about $13,000 left in order to get to that space. Now, um, the really cool thing, the great surprise to you and me both, is that we hit our goal. And we didn't just hit it, we ended the year with $200,137 in giving. This is... An incredible, incredible thing. But the thing that actually is even more incredible than that number is actually how we reached that goal. So I'm going to unpack it a little bit. In 2019, our average attendance on a Sunday morning was 84. So 84 adults and children. And our average attendance in 2018 was the same, 84 adults and children. So we haven't, we've pretty much, I mean, there's been some ebb and flow of people moving and new people coming, but we've pretty much stayed the same size. But our giving, our giving has grown by 19%. Double-digit growth! This is an incredible, incredible thing. Now, I want you to keep in mind that that average of, of 84 adults and children. Okay, so keep that in mind for a second when I continue to unpack this thing. That $200,000 was given by 73 unique individuals. Okay, average attendance, 84 giving by 73 unique individuals. 26 of those people were first-time givers in 2019. This is evidence that it wasn't, it's not just one or two people that are saying, we're gonna make this thing work. This church is going somewhere. We gotta make it work. It is evidence that the burden and responsibility and ownership of, of the mission and vision of this whole church is held by like a large percentage of the congregation. That the congregation as a group is growing in the ways that they are actively saying, like, I wanna be a part of this thing. I, I'm in, I take ownership of what God is trying to do in this place. And that is really, really cool. More and more people in our congregation have chosen to put their trust in the giver more than the gift, in the provider more than just the provision. And no matter their circumstances, no matter the bottom line of what their income was for this, this year, they decided to obediently and faithfully give back to God and allow God to work supernaturally with what they gave and with what they kept. And this, for me, is this picture of growing spiritual maturity and trust in God in our congregation that that really only happens when people start to believe and trust that God is alive and active in this world and that he has a mission that we're all invited to participate in. And when people start to trust that God can do more with what they have than they can do with it and that they wanna see God do incredible and amazing things. And so I am so excited and, and, and just, just feel like there is something happening here at this church. To me, this actually indicates that our congregation is like ready to move, that we've kind of been this like hibernating bear that's like waking up and saying, I'm ready, I'm ready to activate. I'm ready to go, I'm ready to do, I'm ready to take part in this mission that God has invited us in a deeper way in 2020. And so that's actually why we're gonna kick off 2020 with this series we're gonna do called Surprise the World. Uh, This series is really based on a, a book by a guy named Michael Frost, And so if you're interested in getting this book, this is what the cover looks like, and you can Google it on Amazon. You can order it for less than $5. You can follow along as we do this series together. But but ultimately, this series is about God calling us to surprise the world by living lives that trust God and have been transformed by Jesus. 
and empowered by the Holy Spirit as we step into the mission of God. Now, before I dig too deep into like what that means and what we're asking people to do and how we're gonna do this whole thing and live this out and all of this stuff, I wanna make sure that we are on the same page as we talk about the mission of God. What does that actually mean? Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, in chapter 4, we're told that after Jesus is baptized and after he comes out of the desert where he's tempted, there's this interesting thing that Matthew tells us. He says that from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, it's these first nine words that are used to describe Jesus' entire mission here on earth. And we've talked about this before, but these nine words really sum up everything else that he said, everything else that he taught, and everything else that he did. It's all summed up in this, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This was really Jesus' mission statement for why it is that he did everything that he did. Now, for us modern listeners, we're like, "Mm, that's not a very good mission statement. Like, doesn't seem very compelling. I don't really know that I really want to follow that. It's not nearly as good as Nike's Just Do It or uh, McDonald's. What was McDonald's for really? Like, be happy or happiness and a milkshake or whatever McDonald's was. I was like, yes, I want to go there. Can't remember it, but I was compelled by it every single time. Anyways, for modern listeners, we don't think like, yes, Jesus, that is a great mission statement. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And yet, for the original audience, when Jesus preached this message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, people were drawn to it. People went for miles around in order to come and hear what else Jesus had to say, to meet him, to be with him. I mean, Transportation wasn't easy in those days and it didn't matter. The sick and the poor and the powerless would traverse crazy amounts of desert and terrain in order to sit in the presence of Jesus to hear more about this mission he had. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And when they heard it, when they came from all over the regions to hear what Jesus had to say and and to watch him live his life, they were changed. They changed their patterns and the direction of their entire lives. People left their families. They left their jobs. They left their fortunes. They left their security. They left their addictions. They left their entire ways of life just because Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. But here's the deal. The reason it meant so much to them and doesn't really seem like a good mission statement to us is because we have a lot of really weird ideas about heaven and earth. So when Jesus talks about heaven coming near, we really have no construct to understand what it is he's talking about. Now in our minds, we have this idea that heaven is somewhere up over here and that it's perfect, and that it's wonderful, and it's filled with happiness and joy and glory and beauty and mercy and love and justice and compassion, and it never rains for two weeks in a row. (laughs) And that's where God lives, on some billowy cloud or something like that. And meanwhile, this is earth, and it's all the way down here, and it doesn't take much looking around to see that it's filled with destruction and violence and chaos and war and disease and heartbreak and terrible, terrible things. And the story that goes is that heaven's up there and earth's down there and never the two shall meet. And we believe that once upon a time, Jesus came from heaven and he came down to earth so that one day we can all escape earth and and go up to heaven where it's wonderful. But never the two shall meet. The problem is is that when we begin to read scripture, the story isn't compatible. The story doesn't fit with what scripture actually tells us. It doesn't make sense. Instead, we're told in scripture that when God created the world, he actually created this perfect world in complete unity with God, 
where, where heaven and earth overlapped, where earth was filled with love and justice and compassion, just like heaven, like the fullness of heaven was here on earth and it was beautiful. We walked with God in the cool of the garden. <sighs> and humanity felt no shame. But then sin and death entered the world and it was like this wedge forced the two of them apart. But since you can't completely remove God from his creation, there were still these little tiny overlapping spaces where, where you could experience the presence of God. They were the thin spaces where heaven touched earth. This was what the tabernacle and the temple were all about. These were the places you could go to experience the presence of God. But God refused to leave his world like this in so fractured so his mission was to begin to inch heaven and earth closer and closer together until once again the original unity and perfection and beauty of heaven had come to earth. And so Jesus coming to earth was actually like this ultimate game changer to make essentially the power of heaven coming to earth unstoppable. Jesus came to essentially kick the hell out of earth by proclaiming and demonstrating that this new heavenly kingdom had come, that this new heavenly kingdom was upon us. And he told everyone about the generosity of this kingdom that had come near. And then he demonstrated by feeding all of the people as much as they needed to eat, because in the kingdom of heaven, no one goes hungry. And then he told them of the hospitality of this kingdom, where all are invited to come in, regardless of race or religion or nationality or ethnicity. And so he then demonstrated it by setting a table and hanging out with the people that nobody wanted to hang out with. He said, oh, you're a prostitute, come. Come be at my feet. Oh, you're a woman, come. Come be with me, eat with me. You're a tax collector, you're a sinner, I don't care. Come, you're a criminal, you get to be in the kingdom of heaven also. This hospitality of this kingdom was unprecedented. He told everyone about this kingdom that, that knew no bounds and that this kingdom had come near. And then he demonstrated the boundlessness of this kingdom by conquering both life and death to reconcile a rebellious creation to their heavenly Father who loves them. See, Jesus lived this life that we could never live for ourselves and he died this death that absorbed all of the violence and all of the destruction of this world into himself. And he came back to life affirming and demonstrating that death and hell has no power on this earth any longer because heaven has come near. And, and one day, when Jesus returns in all of his glory, when, when he comes back, we get to see heaven once again fully merge to earth. The glory of the kingdom of heaven be restored on this earth in all of its fullness as it was meant to be in the beginning. But then what Jesus did after demonstrating and proclaiming this kingdom had come near, is that he invited all of his followers. He invited all of those who believed that this was truth that he spoke to join him in this mission of proclaiming and demonstrating that the kingdom of God had come to earth and that they were gonna do it by loving their neighbor so that they might experience the kingdom and be raised to life in Christ. Now, the early church, they jumped on this mission like, like a kid jumps on a bed in a hotel room. They just went from one to the other, to the other, to the other. They were like, this is the best thing ever. The early church owned this. They saw themselves as the sent ones. They saw themselves as the one who were sent to continue this mission that Jesus began. To see and, and, and demonstrate and proclaim that the kingdom really had come to earth. To tell everyone about this kingdom and then give them these little tasters, these little appetizers of what this kingdom would be like. And I'm not just talking about like Peter and Paul jumped on this mission. Not just them. I mean, they're the ones that we hear all the stories about. But it wasn't just them. It was hundreds of ordinary people. Hundreds of ordinary followers 
regular, everyday people with jobs that they had to keep to survive, and families and obligations and commitments, just like you and me, who chose to live these lives that were so surprising that they turned the world upside down. They had, the early church, they had this amazing imagination for what the kingdom of heaven looked like here on earth. They found ways to embody these kingdom values. They were generous, regardless of their own income level or their own class. If someone had need, they would, they would sell all they had in order to meet that need. We're told in Acts 2 that they sort of started this, this, this weird economy where they said, oh, you need some, let me sell what I have so that, so that you are taken care of. They were hospitable. They invited people into their homes regardless of the person's nationality, their ethnicity, their race, whether they were slave or free. They had relationships across gender lines and within families. And in the book of Philemon, um, uh, Paul actually encourages Philemon to embrace a runaway slave as a brother and to set him free. This didn't happen. And, and they were people that were led by the Spirit. They were obedient to the Spirit's prompting. They like positioned themselves into places and spaces where they could hear and receive from the Spirit. And then when the Spirit to them, spoke to them, they weren't like, oh, but I don't really, ooh, I don't want, they said, yes, I will go, I will do. In fact, there's this crazy story where Peter is like put in prison because he followed the Spirit into the city and like preached the gospel and then he gets imprisoned and then there's this huge earthquake and he could run away and leave which obviously is the best choice for him, but the Spirit says, no, stay. And you know what Peter did? He stayed. Over and over again, there are these stories of the people being led by the Spirit in the early church. They reflected the image of Christ. When people saw them, they said, you have a different type of humanity that's running through your veins. The way you talk, the way you act, the way you listen, the way you Eat the way you do everything is different. And so when the religious leaders were trying to bring up charges against um, the early Christians in the early church, they would hear the Christians talk and they would be amazed. And they were amazed because they were like, wait a second, these are just like unschooled, ordinary fishermen. How is it that they look so much like their leader? How is it that they look so much like Christ? And knowing that they were sent as missionaries into their own neighborhoods, they loved those around them with this love and this boldness. They loved their enemies. They loved the people that persecuted them. And this, they were like the most surprising and alternative society that you could ever imagine. They lived in this way that proclaimed and demonstrated that a new rule and a new reign had come. And it gave all who heard them and all who witnessed their life this foretaste of the kingdom. It made others hunger and thirst and long for this kingdom. It made them question why it is they're living this way. Why do you give? Why do you love? Why do you invite these people to your table? And you know what they got to respond? Let me tell you about this guy named Jesus. He preached this thing and he said, repent for the kingdom of God is near. And I got to tell them all about this kingdom that was coming. Have you ever lived in such a way that people were surprised by what you were doing? I mean, I know that as a child, I lived in such a way where my mom was very surprised by what I was doing in a bad way. But have you ever lived in such a way that you are so filled with, filled with generosity and hospitality and led by the Spirit and you look like Christ and you understand what your mission is that people are like, whoa, hold, hold on a second. Why are you doing this? Now here's the truth. I think that here at Clarksburg Church, um, we love this picture of God's mission. We love this image of God's kingdom that has come near. 
I think it's super exciting to us. Like on some of your faces as I'm talking about this, they're lighting up as you get excited about what this thing means. I think the reason that some of you come back week after week is because you hear this proclamation of the kingdom and you say, wait, I long for that, I want that, I'm intrigued by that, I wanna understand that more. We want to follow God on his mission. We want to proclaim and demonstrate that the kingdom of God is in this world too. We want to be the people that surprise the world. But I also want to lean into my role as pastor and shepherd for just a moment. Well, I think that we as a congregation really love the idea of this mission. I think that we still struggle a lot to see ourselves as the missionaries. We love this concept of mission and what God's doing in the world, but we struggle to say, yeah, but I'm a part of that. I'm being invited into that and I am living this life out. We think to ourselves like, I love that they did that, but I see myself and I know that I'm not like that. I'm, I'm not like them. And we don't know what to do. We don't know how to fix it. We don't really even know where to start. We think about ourselves and we say, gosh, I'm not really that generous. I don't even want to share my french fries with my husband. <laughs> or we think about ourselves and we say, I'm not really that hospitable. I would rather just stay home in my comfy pants and I don't want to invite people over. We think about ourselves and we say, I don't really look like Jesus to people except if I really have to be nice to them and really have thought a lot about it. And here's the thing, I totally get it. It's true that a lot of us may not see ourselves as looking like people who surprise the world yet. See, becoming people who are so generous and hospitable and spirit-led, Christ-like and missional that it surprises the world isn't a personality type and it's not a gift that some have and others don't. Instead, gifts and personalities may influence the way that we live these things out, but becoming people who are generous and hospitable, spirit-led, Christ-like, and missional comes from regularly practicing being these types of people. And by practice, I don't mean like, hey, you do it and you do it perfectly all the time and well and it always works out the way that you expected it to work. No, by practice, I mean that you do it messily. You do it when you don't want to do it. You, you do it and you slog through and you look back and you say, ooh, I messed up. <laughs> but I'll try it again. It's this type of practice that's developed that over time and regularly practiced that we develop these characteristics and these characteristics begin to be cultivated and inhabit inside of us. Now, um, I was an art major in college. I don't know that everybody knows that, but I was. I don't do that stuff anymore. It's hard. <laughs> But I was an art major in college, and one of the things that was so frustrating was that, like many people who pursue an art, is that you walk up to the art form and you expect that it will just happen. Like we, especially the way that our society is set up, like we go and we visit an art museum and you can see these amazing pieces of work that are done by Cezanne and Matisse and Diebenkorn and whoever it is that you see, right? You see them and you're like, oh, and we have these stories in our head that they just like woke up one day and they were like, I shall create a masterpiece today. That's how, that's how we think about it so often. We believe that they just like wake up and do it. Um, but I remember going to the Picasso Museum in, uh, in Barcelona. I think it was Barcelona. It was somewhere in Spain. The Picasso Museum. And I walk in and I see this amazing painting that I have loved for a really long time. It's this masterpiece that he did called Guernica. And I walk in and it's huge. It takes up the whole room and I look at it and I'm like, oh my gosh, and this happened and this happened and how did he do this and this is amazing. Then you walk into the next room and what you don't realize is that Picasso didn't wake up one morning and like do this. Instead, what you see in the next room are all of these sketches, 
All of these sketches that he like woke up day after day after day and he like tried this and now I'm gonna try this and how does the hair work and how about those horses lips and how am I gonna do this and what is this whole thing gonna look like? He sketched out all of this stuff, painstakingly did this stuff. And even Alexander Calder, perhaps you're familiar with these like really big mobiles that he did. Uh, they look like this. Uh, there's a lot of them in the National Art Gallery. Did you know that Alexander Calder, like, he made one of these, like, it was his habit and his practice to make one of these every day. He didn't, they weren't huge ones. He made these little things of balancing pieces of metal in order to practice how do you shape the metal. He did these little acts, these little habits, until he learned how to do these big things. And that is what we are being called to as people who are being called to surprise the world, to not show up one day and say, today I shall surprise everyone, no. Instead, what we're being called to do are these little, regular, habitual acts of hospitality and generousness and listening to the Spirit and following Christ and continuing to see the world as the place that we are sent to. Now, here at Clarksburg Church, we've been calling those regular practices, those regular habits, a rule of life. It's sort of this way of saying, this is who we've been called to be, these are the habits that I'm going to commit to. Now for many of you, you are probably familiar with our rule of life that's been on our t-shirt. It says pray, give, invite, mentor, serve. And these words represent the habits that are all about making us people who are generous and hospitable, spirit-led, Christ-like, and missional to our neighbors and our neighborhoods. Now my other surprise to you for today is that while we're still holding on to those same core values, those, those same characteristics of generosity and hospitality and spirit-led, Christ-led, and missional, we're actually going to be changing the words to our rule of life. And here's what they look like. They all directly correlate, but we're shifting from pray, give, invite, mentor, serve to bless, eat, listen, learn, and sent. Now, this comes after lots of discussion with people in the congregation, and my hope is that these new, simplified language will actually make these habits a little bit more intuitive, a little bit more tangible for us to figure out how to implement in our everyday lives to practice these habits. Plus, the old acronym was PIGMAS, and the new one is BELLS. So it's just a little bit easier, right? So that's so much better. But just like before, each one of these words has like a specific practice, a specific implementation, a specific habit. So bless. Bless means this, that you are going to commit, that we as a congregation, we individually commit to bless at least three people this week. At least one who is inside of the church and one who is not outside, and one who is not a part of the church. And, and then you get to pick, right? What are you gonna do with the third one? Somebody inside, somebody outside. But here's the deal, the whole inside-outside thing has this amazing ability to unite us together by connecting with those inside, but propel us out into our neighborhoods, into our workplaces, in order to connect and engage with them. So eat. Eat with three people this week, at least one of whom is not a part of the church. Listen, spend at least one period of the week listening for the Spirit's voice. Learn, spend at least one period of the week learning the example of Christ by reading scripture and reflecting it on my life. Sent, record throughout the week the ways that I proclaim and demonstrate to others the universal reign of God here on earth. Now, this isn't like a list of rules that like, if you don't do this, you are out. It's not what this is. Instead, each of these habits is actually designed to cultivate the value and the characteristic that we believe are kingdom values and characteristics in the life of the person who practices them. So think about this for a second. If you bless three people every week, you're going to become a very generous person. And if you eat with others three times every week, you're going to develop a greater capacity for hospitality. 
And if you foster the habit of listening to the Holy Spirit, you're going to be increasingly spirit-led. And if you're learning Christ, it's fair to assume that you're gonna become more and more Christ-like. And if you're journaling the myriad of ways that you've been sent into the world, you're increasingly, you'll increasingly see yourself as sent and a missionary to the people in your neighborhood and your workplaces. So if you want to become a person that is generous and hospitable and spirit-led and Christ-like and sent to love your neighbors, if you want to become a person that will surprise the world, it's going to take practice to develop these habits. Now, for the next six weeks, we're actually going to unpack each of these habits. We're going to talk about each of them, and we're going to explain what is more fully involved in each of these habits. My hope is that even in this moment, if it feels overwhelming, if it feels like, oh my gosh, I I already have a full-time job, and I volunteer these other places, how in the world am I going to have time to do all of these things? Here's what I want to tell you. I promise that you are closer to doing these things than you think. Most of them, some of you already are doing the things, you just don't realize it, and it just takes an awakening to say, oh, if I was just to be intentional with what I'm already doing, it would, it would, we'd go somewhere. For other things, it's like a two degree shift that needs to happen, and a two degree shift may not seem big, But if you travel like miles and miles going two degrees in a different direction, you will end up at a completely different place. And so a year from now, after practicing these habits, week after week after week, what I promise you will happen is that you will find yourselves miles more generous, miles more hospitable, miles more spirit-led, miles more Christ-like, just because of this this two degree shift that could happen in your life. And these aren't meant to be exhausting and they're they're not meant to be overwhelming. They're meant to be empowering and engaging and refreshing. So I wanna offer you an invitation. Invitation is to join us on this journey of practicing the ways that we can surprise the world with the good news that the kingdom of heaven has come near. So, for some of you, this invitation might mean coming on Sundays, coming with an open imagination to listen and to reflect and to hear, all right, what are we doing? How can I imply this? Where's God calling me? For others, you might want to take this journey a little bit deeper. And so what I wanted to offer and invite you into is that me and Delante, Delante and I, are are going to be leading a coaching group for the next six weeks that follows along what we're talking about on Sundays. And the purpose really is to help those of you who are interested do a deeper examination of how to put these habits and practices into your everyday life, to sort of look at the ways that you are gifted and skilled the location and the time allowances that you have, the bandwidth that you have, so that this can be a thing that energizes you and replenishes your reserves rather than like draining you and overwhelming you. And so if you're interested in that, I'd encourage you to sign up for that coaching group. There's a sign-up sheet outside and we'll have that available online too. But one last thing, this whole thing about sort of practicing these habits in ways that don't deplete or exhaust is really, really important because there's nothing surprising about somebody who's exhausted and overwhelmed and burnt out and depleted. There's nothing surprising about that. You know, the crazy thing is that in the, um, in the fourth century, this is my last thing and then we'll wrap up, in, in the fourth century, um, the time of the early church, there was actually this emperor. His name was Julian. And, uh, The early church was rising in the ways that they loved and they cared for other people and they took care of of sort of the whole nation and and he was terrified of this. He was scared that their amazing ability to love and be hospitable and generous was actually gonna like usurp the empire. Uh, He wrote about it and he was terrified. And so what he did was he actually ordered his officials uh, and his pagan priests to try to outlove the Christians 
uh, so that he'd win the people back. And so he created all of these service programs where he uh, created these hostels to take care of people uh, who were traveling so people had a place to stay. And he created these food distribution services so that people had what they needed. They had food to eat. And the program started and big fanfare and this whole thing. And Emperor Julian was like, yes. But despite all of his efforts, all of these programs failed. Like they all failed. And the problem that Julian found was that he couldn't get his officials or his pagan priests to actually like care that much about other people. <laughs> Especially the poor. They just didn't care. See, Emperor Julian had made the mistake that so many people make. He had thought that it was within his own power and within the power of humanity to live this type of surprising life, to live this type of extreme, radical, and generous love. What Julian didn't realize was that the early church was able to live in this way. They were able to love in this extreme and surprising way because they had encountered Jesus. Because they were so filled with the Spirit and they were so transformed by God's love that the surprising way that they lived was simply this overflow of what was already in them. And so what I wanna encourage you to do in these next couple moments is that if you, inside, if you are contemplating, hey, I wanna do this, I, I wanna go on this journey of embedding these habits and these practices in my life, I want to invite you to accept another invitation first. And this is the invitation that Jesus has to come to him, to allow him to transform you, to allow him to surprise you with his overwhelming and abundant and unstoppable love, to allow him to be the one who dwells within you, who reconciles you to your heavenly father, who pours out his spirit in you, so that you're not doing this of your own energy and your own strength, but you're doing this as a child of God who is empowered by his Holy Spirit. There is good news. The kingdom of God has come near. Surprise. Let's pray. Father God, we are in awe of how great this news is. It's better than we could have ever expected that in all the places where we are tired and we are lonely and we sit in darkness, you are bringing a new rule and a new kingdom. You are changing it all around. And so God, we are shocked and in awe and excited and we long for this kingdom. Father, we wanna be a part of this mission. We want to surprise the world too. But first, would you surprise us would you remind us afresh of the ways that you have trans, you can, you can transform our lives, our minds, our hearts. You can set us free from addiction. You can set us free from bondage. You can set us free from sin and shame and death. And so, Father, we ask that you would come. We ask that you would come and empower us and transform us. Father, we know that there are dark spaces around us, places where we sit with people who are in bondage, maybe family members or coworkers or friends or neighbors. And Father, we desire for them to be set free. And so would you fill us with your spirit so we might love and be generous and follow your spirit and look like Christ. We might see ourselves as the sent ones to those dark spaces that are nearby. But first, may we sit in your presence and worship you. We pray all of these things in your holy and your precious name. Amen.